My name is Ray Lopez, and uh, I spent the last almost two months organizing this event. First off, I'd like to uh, thank the Women Her Story Month uh, Committee for showing me all their support. I'd like to thank the administration, faculty, and staff of Laney College also for showing me their support. Um, I'd like to thank everybody here for coming. Um, and most of all, uh, I'd like to thank T for supporting me and uh, cooperating with me in organizing this event. Um, so I started, I organized this event because uh, my major, Asian American Studies, and T uh, brought my attention to the large issue of human trafficking. So I organized this event because I want to be involved. I want to start participating. In order to do that, I have to do things like this. Man, it's hot in here. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to introduce T, and T, please come up here. I met T three years ago in a communications class here at Laney College, and when I first met her, you know, we, I was the first person to start saying something, you know, to her about, you know, our public speaking class that we were taking. And, uh, you know, we started hanging out and, you know, we became very close over the past three years, you know, arguing and having fun together. But uh, without further ado, here you go. What up, Oakland? I gotta get some energy. What's up, Oakland? Yo, it feels so good to be home. I can't say that enough. I mean, this is just amazing. Um, like Ray said, I was just here less than three years ago in school, hustling on my grind, working, hustling downtown, you know, all that good stuff. And so this is just an amazing opportunity. So I definitely wanna do my formal thank yous and also thank the Women Her Story uh, Committee. I wanna thank the administration and definitely thank you, Ray. Um, I think that the ability to have friends back at home is something that's so far and so few. And so I really, really appreciate that support and that constant reminder that I, I do have friends back at home. So, um, this is this is big, you know. Uh, I, I I I am a college student, and I am 25 years old. So a lot of us in here we're kind of like peers, um, and so this is where the the time where I'm going to be age appropriate and get my phone because I kind of need some help for my phone. Um, so there's actually a um, a quote that I want to share with you. I recently got back from studying abroad in London. It was an amazing opportunity, um, and I got to see a exhibit at the Victoria and Albert Museum called uh, Disobedient Objects. Luckily, well, surprisingly, there was an Occupy Oakland sign um, representing all the way in England um, about social movements and social justice. And I happened to uh, get a quote there that was really important, specifically when we talk about the issue of human trafficking. This quote is by Audre Lorde, um, and it says, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Our struggles are particular, but we are not alone. And I think that's something that we have to keep in mind when we talk about the issue of human trafficking. And just uh, bringing down to a humanistic level, this morning I was struggling, trying to figure out, well, I think it's been the last few days particularly, I've been you know, trying to figure out what should I wear? You know, because I'm used to being a professional and I'm used to being um, in a suit and having on my heels and things like that. But then, you know, I'm from Oakland. I gotta represent, I gotta let you know I'm no, no different than maybe where you are. Um, and so I, I struggle with it. And so it was the issue of, am I feeling good? Do I feel good enough? Am, am I being good enough? Um, so am I being good enough for the people that I'm here 
um, that, that are asking me to be here, but am I also being here good enough for my audience? And I think that that's a very important place that I want to start at. Um, I think that that was relevant in my life, particularly in my story. Um, I grew up primarily in the foster care system. So my early memories, I think my first memory was a dead blue bird. Uh, and I was walking with my foster sister and I never forget the feeling of hopelessness and how just isolated and desolate I felt looking at that baby dead bluebird. And, um, and just from there, there was just memory after memory. Uh, my, my story, my, uh, I had someone in my family actually first uh, be the person to exchange me. Um, I was four years old and I was left in a house with a man and a little Caesar's pizza in exchange for a vial of heroin. Um, by the time I was five years old, after being removed from my, foster, from my placement again, my home again, placed back in the foster care system for the second time, I was then put back at my original home at five years old where um, I was removed after being hit by a car. I spent two weeks in Children's Hospital Oakland with a broken pelvis. The very next day after I got out of the hospital, I was back into foster care. So uh, my, my story is just that. I mean, I had two parents. The story of my, my mother is that she, this is a third generational issue. She herself was sexually trafficked. She herself was a victim of um, child abuse and child ex exploitation in a way in which it was so personal. She actually was a victim of incest. My father, um, he was one of those mi uh, middle-class families you know, basically came from a middle class family and he was so sheltered his whole life that when he got away, he did not want to go back. So they both were, you know, heroin, drug addicts before I was born. I had an older sister who was um, in care before I was even born. So spent my time in foster care, um, bouncing around homes, feeling, you know, feeling worthless, feeling like I wasn't anybody, like I wasn't good enough, like I didn't belong, going back to the original statement about am I good enough with my attire. Um, and so um, at eight years old, I was reunified again after I tried as a young person to advocate for myself, um, knowing the conditions back at my, at my or or home of origin. I advocated for myself and asked not to go back, but I was placed back with my biological mother. Shortly thereafter, myself and my younger sister, as I had had a younger sister at that point, um, were adopted in Reno, Nevada. Um, there I came back and was placed back in the foster care system upon being flown back to Oakland. So um, that was a very just early and fundamental age between the ages of eight and 10. Uh, there was so much that I didn't get to learn. Um, I was very needy. And I think to this day, I find myself very much of an affectionate person because I grew up in a time in foster care when you were, when the foster parents were taught not to hug or kiss their child um, in fear of sexual lawsuit. And so I find myself at that age, you know, just a very needy person. But I, I was smart. I mean, I had lived some life. I had seen some things you know, having such an experience happen to me when I was four years old was such, you know, a pro profound thing. And growing up, you know, on, on visits with my biological mother, she wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't herself touch me. But I most recently come to grips in understanding that the fact that she would have sex in the bed with me was not um, preventing me from child abuse. Um, and so uh, th those fundamental age, you know, made me realize I was needy, but I, I had learned a lot. And I knew a lot, and I knew how to talk. That's one thing I've always had, is I like to talk. If you can't tell, I'm a communications major, and I love to talk. Um, and uh, so when I was 10 years old, so let's just fast forward it. Um, I was 10 years old. I was in the foster care system. I had just been through so much in my life. Um, like I said, back and forth within my biological family with the foster care system, growing up in foster homes where I'm being abused and neglected, both physically, sexually, um, definitely verbally and mentally, you know, being made to feel like I wasn't anything, being told that I was nothing but a paycheck, you know, my whole life being controlled by other people and moving from home to home to home. So when I met a man when I was 10 years old, who promised me that he was gonna love me unconditionally, and he was gonna have my back, and he was gonna take care of me, and he was gonna, you know, give me the nice things, and, you know, just, I mean, let's just be real. 
as a as a young girl, that's just something that was just so like, ah. Uh. Um, but specifically in that age, you know, at 10 years old, I was a child. I didn't really know much as far as about life except for what I had already experienced, which was rough. So having this man tell me, oh, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be constant. That's the biggest word that I want to say is constant. Um, that was that was really what was important. So, so let me pause on my story because there's an important um, factor that I want to bring you guys back to. Has anybody, and please raise your hand, have you ever wanted someone to notice you? Please raise your hand. All right. And have you ever succumbed to peer pressure? Please raise your hand. Have you ever trusted someone you shouldn't have? Hmm. And have you ever wanted to be a part of something? Raise your hand. Have you ever needed help but didn't know where to go? And lastly, have you ever been taken advantage of? That's what was going on for me. So a lot of people ask, well, oh, does it have to be a certain type of young individual that is vulnerable for human trafficking? Is it, you know, that they have to come from a certain place? Or those basic questions make everyone in this room vulnerable for human trafficking. So these were all questions that I was going through at the time and, and well, well, issues that I were going, was going through at the time. And so I met this man, he promised me forever. Little did I know that forever meant that I had to sell my body every day to make at least $1,000 um, and $200 of that had to go on drugs every day. So if I didn't do it, I'm gonna be beat to a pulp, I'm all messed up and don't nobody care. The first three years I was being trafficked, now mind you, I started right here in Oakland on International on 21st in, some, in a white wife beater, some blue jean shorts, and some pink Converse's. I had no body. People knew I was young, but that meant a higher price. That more, meant more profit and more money for the person who was exploiting me. And so just, you know, understanding that I was just in such a vulnerable place, um, it was deep. It was deep. And so I met this man. He promised me forever. I had to sell my body not only on the streets, but on Craigslist. I was in the back of the East Bay Express. I was doing it all. Any way that there was a way to get money, this man was having me do it. So like I said, the first three years of my victimization, I was still in foster care. Um, after that, I had uh, gotten some gotten moved and some stuff, and I just was on the streets. So there was no point in staying anywhere constant. I actually want to show you guys a picture of what I used to look like. This is me at 13. That's me right there on the right. And I think the picture says a thousand words. And if you just look at that picture, you can tell. I mean, I clearly was high in this picture. Um, I, I, at that point, had just been a young teenage girl who had seen too much and went through too much. And... Um, and that was the girl that was being sold for profit, not, on, not only just on the streets, like I said, in various ways. Um, luckily, well, let me back it up. I was being sold, but what happened was is that he actually ended up recruiting other girls. So the story goes is that he had re recruited a few other girls. Um, I was at his time what the bottom bitch was. And then the new other girls came. They were older. They were able to do more. They slowly earned themselves up the ranks, so on and so forth. Um, what ended up happening was one of the girls who had been a girl that I've known on and off since my experience started, um, she ended up becoming pregnant with his child. She, at the time, had a mother who was very involved in her life very much involved in her life. And so her mother actually started an investigation on him without us knowing. So when I was 15 and I had ran away from him, uh, there were moments that I ran away just for dear life after being beat and bloodied. And this time particularly, I'll never forget it. Um, it used to be the Dollar Inn off of Coliseum Way over there by Hagenberger. And it was a New, Year's, a New Year's Day and he beat me so bad. He left me outside one day on International and I was outside for 15 hours with shorts on and a wife beater, um, somewhat the same outfit that I had started off in. And he left me outside because he was a, uh, does anybody ever, anybody ever heard of Bellucci, the cocaine heroin mix? They sell it in balloons around here in East Oakland. 
Um, he he was very much a, a big guy off of that. So he would snort that all day and then smoke weed and just do everything. So he fell asleep. So I'm outside for 15 hours in the storming rain. Uh, there's just so much going on. But I didn't make no money. Ain't nobody outside when it's storming and lightning and it's crazy outside. So um, he beat me. He beat me so bad. And I ran that day. But I just wanted to show you another picture of one of my online pictures. Um, this was me, um, and please forgive me, I wanted to be appropriate. Um, that's a blurred picture. That is actually me. I was 15 in this picture, 15. On Craigslist, that's what, what I look like. That's what he had me looking like. And so um, when I was 15, uh, I finally ran away from him after this, night, this hellish night. And I was still being exploited on the streets from his street family. At the time it occurred, when I was still being exploited, I had gotten arrested by the police. I was, again, I was in foster care, so being word of the state, we always got taken back. When you get picked up by the police, you go back to the assessment center, which is located in Hayward. So, I got picked up by the police one time, and then I got cornered basically by two FBI agents that basically let me know that the, the young girl that was also working for him had an investigation on him, basically spilled the whole thing. I had snuck a cell phone in the assessment center, which is a big no-no. But I did it, and as soon as I got a chance, I ran to the bathroom and was like, yo, even though I hate you and hate your guts, and this is the epitome when we talk about human trafficking, we talk about Stockholm Syndrome. Even though I hate your guts, I want you to know that they, 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 they're on you, and they know. Shortly thereafter, he uh, got into an issue with his cousin. His cousin was a man who he often um, hung out with and spent a lot of time with us, um, and he would beat his cousin and hold a gun to his cousin's head and make his cousin do things like rape me and sodomize me and, and, and do terrible things. And so not only was I, as a young girl, scared of him, but there were grown men scared of this man. So I just want to like just basically put an emphasis on the fear factor here. I was scared for my life. There was no way that I wasn't scared for my life. So basically, he got an altercation with his cousin and at the hospital, he had, his cousin hit him with a car. At the hospital, he called the police to, to basically snitch on his cousin. Well, he didn't know he had a million dollar um, warrant out for his rent for pimping and pandering because of the young girl. So that's where he got, got arrested. At that point, I felt like I was free. I was trying to stay free as much as possible. I was trying to run away. I ended up being exploited out in Las Vegas, went to jail. So if I could just do a re quick recap, recap about my birthdays. 10 through 13, I can't really remember. 14, I was in San Diego. 15, I would, no, no, 14, I was in Las Vegas. 15, I was in San Diego. 16, I was on a Greyhound coming back from the state of Washington. And 17, I was right there on 150th in San Leandro at Juvenile Hall. That was my birthdays. Um, so basically, just going back to the story with him, at 15, um, he was arrested. And um, they tried to get me to testify. I wouldn't. I was fearful for my life. That is still a topic that's very sensitive to me to this day. Um, and I wouldn't testify, I was here for my life, but his street family continued to exploit me, um, which is why I ended up getting a stay away order from the state of Nevada by the time I was 16, and I spent my 17th birthday in juvenile here. Luckily, the breath comes in the silver lining, and I wanna say that in regards to uh, very specific things. What made me vulnerable, I wanna, I wanna backtrack. Things that made me vulnerable was A, I was in a, in a system. I was in a system in which so many young people come through the cracks. So not only was I a dependent of the child welfare system, but being a dependent of the child welfare system and with the traumas that I had already endured, I was also a consumer of, the men of mental health services. So I was also in the mental health system. In the same time, I was going in and out from my issues, both here in Alameda County and in Las Vegas, of the juvenile justice system. So there were three systems in which, you know, somebody could have done something, but at that time, not a lot of people really knew what to do. Um, I think that my story changed in the opportunity of connections. I met two key people in my life that really changed, uh, 
changed my whole mindset um, and really made me see that there was hope. The first was a woman who I had met when I had gotten taken back to the assessment center. And I said, hey, I'm not going to stay. Y'all know I'm going to run away. And the woman there said, okay, it's fine. I know you're going to run away, but just promise to meet this one lady. And I was like, all right, whatever. I, because I liked it, the assessment center. See, the assessment center was, is a 23-hour facility. And you can stay there. And you can take a shower. And you can see the doctor. And you can get food to eat. And, and you're protected. So, but you can go out, but can't nobody come in. There's police around. So for me, anytime I went to the assessment center when I was on the streets, it was like a break. It was like, yes, these are my folks. Now, granted, I cuss them out and say, oh, you don't know about nothing about me because they trying to cover me up when I got my, my booty shorts on and my, my chest out. And nah, y'all ain't going to do. But those were my friends. So when they asked me to stay, I stayed. So I met this woman who actually had had known about my case since I was eight years old. And she was the first person to say to me, so when I met her, I said, oh, you know, I'm going to run away. And I know, just like many other services in the foster care system, ain't none of y'all going to do nothing for me if I don't send you a little placement, so I'm not about to stay. And what ended up happening is this woman said, I commit to you that I am going to stay in your life whether or not you are going to be in placement, meaning I'm going to call your phone. I'm going to check for you. I'm going to look for you. At the same time, and it's sad that she just left, um, my public defender who had been on my case since I was 13 was very adamant in my life. She was the one go-to person that I would always call. She, um, she was the only one I trusted. I hated my social worker. So my public defender and this new woman was like my go-to people. So this woman kept her commitment. She uh, followed through with me. I mean, there would be times I'd be hungry and I just needed a hot meal. I'd be half naked, come outside of hotels on 35th, you know what I mean, at the Highlander, on um, MacArthur, and be like, you know, I just need some food. Can you get me this? I just need, you know, I need women products. You know, I need this, I need that sometimes. I was going through it, but she stuck by me. So did my public defender. And then shortly after, when I started to get away from the nonsense and necessarily, uh, Primarily when I got away from Oakland, I started to really get out. I met somebody that changed my life. And he, I, would, I call him my first boyfriend. And I was young, and I was living with him for the first six months of, of our relationship, and he didn't even know how old I was. Um, I'll never forget when I brought him my birth certificate, and he was sitting in the bathtub, and he almost had a heart attack. And he didn't come home for three days because he was, like, not cool with that. Um, but he was the first man that told me, I was going to be something different. He was the first man that told me that you're going to be somebody and you're going to make a difference and that you have intelligence and you have strength and you have resilience that is beyond beauty that's going to get you paid. And that was something that was so, just so important coming from a man. Like I said, I didn't really have the father figure, my parents being drug addicts. My mother and father both always in jail. My dad was in prison since I was about three, I think. Um, so coming from a man, it was just so important. It was so amazing to hear somebody tell me that I could be something and to tell me to have, you know, find things of, of worth. You know, even down to the way that I spent my money, he was the first person to say, you don't buy a whole bunch of cheap stuff. You save your money and get something of quality. And I'll never forget that because that's kind of how you got to live life too. You, 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 you can't just go around just sparing, this is for this little bit moment, this is for that moment, I'm going to take this risk, I'm going to do that, I'm going to just jump in and jump out. You have to live your life with quality. Slow down. Take a breather. So um, those two people basically changed my life. Um, well, those three people, shall I say. So after um, being exited out of juvenile hall after my 17th birthday, I really felt like I wanted to make a change. I started to go to a GD program right here at the Scotland Center. That, that worked out for a little while, and I did that, and I finished it, but I wasn't ready to take my GD. But then I wanted to get my high school diploma, so I went to Edward Shands off a of church in East Oakland, and I was like, okay, this will work. I'll go to the adult school for a while, but that was taking too long. Then I was like, nope, I'm just going to work. So I worked right here in Oakland for the Mayor's Summer Job Program, and I worked right at Poplar Park in West Oakland. And that's where I met somebody who told me about the East Bay Conservation Corps. The East Bay Conservation Corps, now known as Civil Corps, right there in West Oakland, um, they were the ones that gave me the opportunity to get my high school diploma. And this is after 
you know, I've got all of this drama and sledge and they were the ones. And so it really began an amazing adventure from there after being exited out of juvenile hall for my 17th birthday. Um, and I think it brings it back to, down to you guys. As, as young people and specifically um, as individuals as a part of a community, why should you care? Well, this affects everyday people. You never know how many other young people in your Laney classrooms, because young people, when I was in Laney, didn't know what I, my experience was. You may not know, you know, how many community members you run into, some of your professors, or other individuals who may have had this experience or who have had family who have endured this experience. Um, it crosses socioeconomic lines. So. Uh, one thing that is a real factor of this issue, and I think it relates so much when we talk about um, Asian studies, is that a lot of Asian, Asian countries that are um, known for, you know, being, you know, um, being a part of, being victimized, I guess, the country's being victimized by having human trafficking tourism, it's because they are countries that are often in poverty. And so this applies specifically here as well, is that a lot of the young people and individuals who are victimized by sex trafficking are often, you know, you know, come from populations of vulnerabilities of living in poverty. All of this is a part of vulnerabilities of living in poverty. Um, but it, it doesn't end there. there. You know, there's also the rich girls who, you know, never see their parents. And, you know, their, their love gets bought all the time. That they, they want to feel some connection. They want to be a part of something. Those young people oftentimes become vulnerable to be sex trafficked. So it crosses socioeconomic lines. Um, it affects all types of people, you know, black, white, you know, everyone. Um, it, it affects all types of races. It affects all types of individuals in regards to our sexuality. Uh, something that's important, I, sp I think specifically for me to talk about is that um, we are in a, a new place in our world that we are accepting um, of people in their place and meeting them where they're at. And so we have to understand that this affects us as you know, straight people, as LGBTQ people, this affects all types of individuals. Um, this affects the rich and the poor. Um, I think Facing the issue of human trafficking is really the epitome of social justice and social action. Um, it is an issue, like I said. And, and, and all of our experiences, like the quote said, we're not a single issue individual, so we should not just commit to a single issue. I see this issue and I have to look at it on various platforms. And so understanding that it's, it's an issue that's a large issue, it's the third largest in the world um, and growing, and it's something that needs to be addressed. And, and I, I feel like how we do that is that we have to understand that what are we doing here at Laney? We're getting our education. Why? Because we all want to be whatever it is that we want to be. Um, for me, I was at Laney and I don't, didn't know what I was going to do. I still don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up. I am a communications major and I want to do media broadcasting. And that's important and relevant. Why? Because I can have the platform to shed light on issues such as this. So we need those of you who are doing social studies to do social work. You know, we need those who are studying law. We need lawyers and judges to change practices and protocols. We need those of you who wanna be in healthcare. We need nurses who are gonna address the issue when they see a young person coming through the emergency room. We need clinicians, those people who are gonna sit down and take the time and really understand what trauma-informed care means in addressing the issues and meeting, and meeting the needs of young people. Um, so I challenge the room. Think of some things that your own major can, can help not only this issue, but various issues. I think another thing that is so real when we talk about the issue of human trafficking is a lot of victims, like I said, it's, it, it seems to be an intergenerational thing. For myself, my example, my mother, was the second generation, I'm the third generation. So this was something that was accepted, accepted. And I think that we need to give more supports to young parents in regards to raising these ch children right. I think that it's not about just, oh, you know, can we help these young girls when they get in it and these young boys, because it's not just young women, it's also young men and LGBTQ youth. But um, understanding that prevention is key. 
Preventative work is the, is the key. Um, and it's about changing perspectives. So we have to make this visible. One of my biggest, I think, strengths in my work is really changing the perspectives in which we look at human trafficking. Because right now, all the billboards that you see and everything that you're gonna hear about is, oh, human trafficking, modern day slavery. You're gonna see a billboard with somebody chained up in some handcuffs. That's not what it looks like, boo-boo. That's not human trafficking. Human trafficking is how we talk about what we see on international as, oh, that's just pimping and hoeing. Oh no, that's a normalizing thing by calling it pimping and hoeing. That's normalizing it. No, we have people exploiting other people for their own benefit. Because very often, these young people who are actually being exploited don't even have the ability to hold their own money. We have to change the way in which we talk about the language. We cannot refer to young people, when we, when we refer to young people who are being victimized, we cannot refer to them as prostitutes. Prostitutes gives a negative connotation that they are willing participants. Oftentimes, like I previously said, there are vulnerabilities of not only living in poverty, but probably household issues that make these young people vulnerable. They oftentimes, a majority, over 60% of these young people in na nationwide studies come from various systems. So we have to look at, the, at that part, that piece as well. We have to change the language in which we not only talk about the young people, we cannot refer to them as prostitutes, that's a terrible word. Um, we cannot talk about them as prostituted children. Again, it's that negative connotation. So we, talk, we have to talk about it. This is the, the, the sexual exploitation of children. These are commercially sexually exploited children. We also have to change the way in which we talk about the language of really the root. It's supply and demand. If we get and address demand more, then we will see a change in, in this issue. When we talk about the, the other countries that are being affected about this, we have to get to the root of stopping sex tourism. How do we stop that in other countries? And here, how do we make it to where our society says that it is wrong to purchase a child? We have to make that change. And so we have to change our labels. One thing that kills me about this field is that we, we use these labels as like Johns and Tricks, and that is not what they are. They are buyers of sex from children. They are child pedophiles and child rapists. We need to start addressing it as such because when we use the term John, it just makes it like you're everybody else. What's up, John, Nicholas, George, James? You're just normalizing it. You're continuing to normalize it. So. We have to change our language. We have to change our practices and protocols. Uh, we have to be more responsive, responsive to the needs of victims. We not only need to help young people when they're first changing their life, but understand that life is not over, boo-boo. I am 25 years old in college across the country. I'm from Oakland, California, and, and there's very few people who check up on me. And we have to change that. Not, not just, like I said, my story is, is per solely for the benefit of understanding that this, this is just one slight story of a, a bigger perspective. As I'm speaking to you guys right this second, there are young people on international being trafficked. There are young people selling their bodies in, in the Marriott downtown. There are things going on on Backpage right as we speak. So we just have to keep that in mind and be, be mindful of that. Um, we have to come up with understanding the way that we collect our data. There's so many different skewed um, statistics on human trafficking, but we have to think about who is collecting the data, which is the way, that, what are the way that they're asking the questions. A lot of times, and this is the biggest thing that I have, uh, the biggest argument I hear when it comes to human trafficking, is people are like, oh, well, okay, I hear you, and for me, my area of expertise is child sex trafficking. But a lot of people are like, what, what happens with those who claim that they're sex workers and that they are, an, they are adults that want to do this work? And what I say is, if you start to ask them the right questions in the right way, you will soon to find out that a majority, if not all, of those individuals who claim to be sex workers and for it had some form of sexual exploitation in their, in their, in their adolescence. It's just about the way that we ask the questions. And so and that's something to be mindful. Um, we have to change the way in which opportunities are existing for um, young people or people individual, 
period, who have been sex trafficked. For example, I am somebody who has changed my life. That was seven years of my life, 10 to 17. It's done, it's over. Now I'm able to live an amazing life. Um, but I wanna be able to contribute just like everybody else when it comes to day-to-day -day, um, contributions that people get to do in society. So for example, I wanna donate blood, but there's a rule that says that anyone after 1977 who has exchanged sex, money, or any other form of pain, I'm sorry, money, drugs, or any other form of payment for sex cannot donate blood. These are issues that happen that needs to be addressed when we talk about human trafficking. Because not only does it, it stop a, a former victim, because no longer my victim, I test clean. I've been tested repeatedly over and over. Um, not only does it stop a former victim to be able to contribute to society in a whole, it stops the benefit from what that blood could do. So just keeping those things in mind. Um, we have to understand that our work in, in addressing human trafficking is to hope to give the same rights and liberties as everyday individuals and citizens to those who have been sex trafficked. And that goes both for victims who are international and um, here domestically. Well, a, a big factor that a lot of people don't know is there's a majority, there is a, a law called the TVPA. It has been reauthorized, which most recently there's been new funds allocated. But previous to the reallocation, there was a federal standing in which victims of tra uh, sex trafficking had $10 million to get that money. But let me tell you the catch, it was anybody who was international. So only international victims could tap into that money. And so currently, uh, now there's been a reauthorization, and so we have the ability to help victims um, of, that are domestic. And those are things that, when I talk about what are you doing in, in your work and when you're, do, when you're doing your everyday classes and when you're busting through tests and you're like, why the hell am I going through this midterm? Remember, your work could be important and pivotal in helping victims of human trafficking in some of the ways that I mentioned, but not only in this issue, but in others. So we have to change the way in which we confront the issue. Again, um, understanding that prevention is key, um, that there needs to be proper assessment. I think here in California, California nationwide, again, I am actually here from Baltimore, Baltimore Maryland, um, and I do a lot of work federally on Capitol Hill. And I tell you one thing, everybody knows California knows their stuff. And I'll tell you, here in Oakland, we have West Coast Children's Clinic who is key at um, when it comes to assessments. They are amazing when it comes to assessments and um, what to do. We need to also talk about transitioning young people. When they transition from their lives before um, and after, and so what does that look like? We can't just put these young people all in group homes or in congregate care. Because for example, right before I emancipated um, at, out of my group home here in Oakland, I was up on a seminary in MacArthur at Cairo's. That's where they would put a lot of young people who were sex trafficked. And what happened is the neighborhood started to call the place high hoes instead of Kairos, because they knew that it was a place where young people who were victimized would go, and so pimps would patrol right around there and wait for us. Um, so it's, it's just to be mindful. I think, um, I'm gonna scratch my notes right now because I think there's a lot of things that I didn't get to talk about that was important. And one thing is about seeing this issue on a basic humanistic level. We so much wanna see this issue as separate from us and not a part of us, but we have to realize that there like I said, the questions that I asked you, always reflect on those. Those are questions that make young people vulnerable. Um, also, but the fact is that we have to look at it not with, with uh, sympathy, but with empathy. We all are survivors of something. And that is what we have to go back to, is that we are all survivors of something. So there's something in our lives that we have survived through, whether that's, you know, physical abuse, you know, whether that's domestic violence or verbal, verbal abuse, you know. We've all endured and been through something. And so we have to think about what, it, what was it that we wanted people to extend to us. We wanted compassion. We wanted, you know, someone to listen unjudgmentally. Those are the things that we have to keep in mind when we talk about victims of human trafficking. I think something that else is very important, and I want to just, um, I want to shout out to the young women who have focused in basically like women's studies and social studies. 
How is this relevant to you? Because it's obvious that systematically women have been oppressed for years. I mean, there was a suffragist movement. We got the right to vote in 1920, but there's still far to go. We do not have equal pay. There's so much. And, and basically, when we talk about human trafficking, we have to be realistic in understanding that a majority, at least 85% of victims, are young women and girls. And so when we look at the statistics, we have to be mindful that our work does not only stop at, you know, trying to get equal pay or, you know, equal rights, but also to, you know, make the world stand up and take change in some of the patriarchal practices and injustices that made situations like this occur. And I just think that those are, those are very relevant things that we have to talk about. Um, there is so much that I feel like I want to say that I could say. I think that I've been talking forever and I don't like to talk too much. And I think that there's people that may have questions. Um, I know that I sped it up a lot. I also wanna let you guys know, because I, I didn't mention it, I failed to mention it. Uh, also what made me vulnerable during the time, like I mentioned earlier, that my sister, my older sister was the only person that I knew my entire life. Um, she was killed when I was 14 when it really got bad. Also, I mentioned the man who helped change my life. Um, he was shortly killed after my 17th birthday. And I remember feeling like I didn't know what I was gonna do or where I was gonna go and feeling like I had no other choice. And I'll never forget what someone told me. And it was so relevant. They said, how would he feel? How would you be honoring his memory if you went back? And it was at that moment I realized that I would never go back because I have to honor his memory because he meant so much to me. It was so relevant in my life. So these were things that happened. So they, they brought me down. And trust and believe that brought me down so hard when he died when I was 17 and I had nowhere else and no one else. But it was the only thing that kept me constant in realizing that I had to go forward. And so I, um, I've been talking for forever, but I just want to wrap up with saying that although these crazy things have happened to me. Um, I've been able to do amazing work, you know, with my experience. I was able to help fund, found two local programs here um, in Oakland, both a program helping and providing a drop-in center, which I ran for two years uh, for victim of commercial sex trafficking here in Oakland. But also I was able to help uh, start and develop a foster youth advocacy program here and a uh, mental health behavioral health care board um, here in Oakland before I left. And so now I've taken some of the stuff I've g done here. I now serve on the board of directors for the Human Rights Project for Girls based in Washington, D.C. in the Human Rights Building. I also serve um, as an expert for the Expert Council for Shared Hope International, which is a, um, a human trafficking organization. I also serve on the National Foster Care Youth and Alumni Policy Council, and I am an inaugural member And in what we do is advise Health and Human Services of the U.S. government. I have been able to be blessed to work with some of the greats down to Google and American Bar Association and the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. I've gotten, look, Jay-Z ain't the only one that had dinner with Robert De Niro at Tribeca. I'm just saying. Boo, Google it. I'm just saying. So um, I've gotten to do things like that. I've gotten to, um, I've been awarded next to Jennifer Lopez and Gloria Steinem, which is so much a part of women's studies, um, for Glamour Magazine's 2011 Woman of the Year. I've gotten to um, be featured as Time Magazine's 30 People Under 30 Changing the World in 2013. And last year, I was named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. And what was so important about my spot is I was named right after Barack Obama as a leader and as a modern day abolitionist. <laughs> and I say this all humbly and, and, and it means, I think this is the most best applause that I've ever gotten because this is home. There's so many familiar faces and this is probably the most nerve wracked I've ever been in a speak. Um, there's so many familiar faces and a lot of people have seen me grow through this transition and been there. I mean, I've got people in this audience that I've argued with that I haven't gotten so along with and I've had people who've seen me struggle and um, you know, endure with me. And so I just wanna say um, a quote that keeps me going and a quote that you should think about when we talk about this issue and various other issues is this one right here. It's by F. Scott Fitzgerald and it goes like this. 
The test of first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still have the ability to function. One should, for example, see that things are hopeless and yet be determined to make them otherwise. So thank you, it's been my honor. Thank you everybody for coming here. Uh, I hope you guys learned a lot and enjoyed her speech. Um, how do you guys feel about a short Q&A before we get out of here? Yes? Okay, so right now I'm gonna hand the mic back to T and, or better, hmm. If anyone has questions, do you mind coming uh, up here to, Ask him. I have one. So. Hey, thank you so much. I'm Carla Dardis with the District Attorney's Office, and uh, it takes such incredible strength for you to tell your story like that and just stay on point and just be with folks. So thank you. You had commented about these different models of housing that doesn't work, that doesn't work. So I was curious about something, which is through your travels, have you seen different models and approaches around housing and around integrated services? And could you speak to that? Kathleen, I really appreciate you, your office, and um, that question that you just asked. I think that, again, like I said, I think that there's various amazing models, and I think with the right supports and, and really wraparound services, and what we mean by that is really taking care of various levels when we talk about the, you go, you go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and just look it up, and when we talk about wraparound services, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the full person, the full individual, and so I believe, um, I, I personally, think that individualized care is best. So I really am somebody that, that supports um, therapeutic foster care. I'm someone that supports, um, you know, second chance programs. I think something that's so prevalent when we talk about human trafficking is that one thing we have to remember is that the one person that's not gonna close their arms is that of the exploiter. The exploiter is never gonna close their arms. So we have to set up housing programs and placements that the young people are always able to go back to, that they always know that they, this is home. Um, again, it's about that constant. And one thing that I can say is, before those two, in, those two, well, three individuals came into my life, the, only, the most constant person in my life was that of my exploiter. So we have to um, look at more programs, you know, and I know therapeutic foster care is something that's coming and going in some states. So in some states it's phasing out, some states it's phasing in. Um, I really believe in trauma-informed foster care, and that's a new concept in which people are looking at. I think that we have to go back to the basics. Um, some issues that I have with certain safe harbor laws are that they, you know, say a young person is trafficked and they're, you know, currently in their home of origin, and once they're found to be a victim of sex trafficking, they're put into foster care placement. I don't believe that that should be the case, again, because the statistics show that a majority of the young people that are already being trafficked come from these systems. And so I believe that we need to do more in regards to family maintenance. Um, we need to do more in regards to offering opportunities. I know here, um, when I was here two years ago, we had um, a program called uh, ARS, Another Road to Safety, that basically if child welfare services um, you know, were notified and there was a way that the child can stay at home, but the parent could have some help with their caseloads and things like that, that is necessities. Again, I think it's, it's about, we have to remember that it's a village to raise a child. And so, um, I want to say that I always first and foremost believe if, if, the tra if the traffickers are not the parents or the family, then the child should stay in the family home with supports. And so that's the first, um, the first option I would say. Secondly would be therapeutic foster uh, care or trauma-informed foster care. And, um, but I think we should always d think of congregate care and uh, detention as our, finally detention as our last result. But congregate care specifically, um, as our second to last resort. I think that congregate care works when there's an individualized um, focus. And when, and this is something that's important too to human trafficking in a whole. When we talk about, when we shift it from independence to interdependence and understanding that we allow young people to be themselves and find their own um, nicks and knacks and, and their ways and, and what they wanna do and so on and so forth. Um, so we, we give them that independence and that individuality with, with supporting the idea that in, interdependence is that we are all in this together. Because ultimately, 
That's what we all have to remember. Who gives us a job? We're working for somebody. We are all interdependent. Ain't nobody in here independent. Not one person in here is independent. And you can laugh at me all day, but I know that. Because you know what? If you sell something, you need customers to buy it. If, you, um, if you're, you know, a, a lawyer, you need judges. And, and, you know, I mean, come on now. So um, just I think that we have to have placements that focus on um, trauma-informed services, individualized uh, um, did I turn it off? Oh. Individualized services and making sure that they have full wraparound, and that is while they're currently in placement as well as transitioning out. Oh, you loud? Okay, you got it. You got it. All right. Oh, I got one. Anyway. Thank you for coming. Um, hi. <laughs> um. So inspiring. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be, to see you like this. This is absolutely bananas. But um, my question I have too, actually, the first one was you talked a little bit about the um, uh, intersectionality between uh, exploitation and foster care. How does that happen? Like, why is that an actual risk factor? Um, Can I start there? Okay. Only because you know I've been forgetting. Um, so I want to start there. So Things that made me vulnerable for sex trafficking after being in the foster care system were first, I was used to people controlling my life. I was used to tons of people controlling my life. So I had a foster parent, I had a social worker, I had a therapist, I had, you know, a public defender, I had a judge, I had all these different people that controlled my life. And so when it came to human trafficking, when it was told to me that there was going to be one person that controlled everything, in my mind as a child, it's like consolidation. Okay, it makes it all one. Then another thing is that in foster care, like I said, being abused in such a way, being told, oh, I don't care what happens to you, you ain't nothing but a paycheck, it normalized the idea of being used for an object of financial gain. That's what it did. And so for me, hearing that I ain't nothing but a paycheck continued to make me realize, oh, well, then I'm not nothing but to provide for income for that of someone else. Another thing is that what people don't realize is when you move young people from foster home to foster home to foster home, how is that much different to a child than from moving from hotel to hotel to hotel? And that's kind of how it transferred for me. It was like, this isn't no different. This is the same thing that I've gone through. Um, and lastly, I think one thing that was a big factor is the fact that because, and, and I've been working with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children to do better work, and we, we actually just started a campaign on this. Um, but there, because of foster care, there was the assumption that I was always a runaway. Even when I was like, had a gun to my head and like was getting beat out my pump, like there was always the assumption, oh, she just gone, she just ran away, she just doing her thing, whatever, whatever. So that means there's no Amber Alerts, there's nobody with flyers, there's nobody looking for me. So the exploiter knows that. So he's like, ain't nobody looking for you. And the one time, I'll tell you a funny story, the one time that I did get um, arrested on some just random being in the wrong place at the wrong time at a hotel here in Oakland. I was took not in Oakland, San Leandro. I was taken to the San Leandro Sheriff Station. And like I said, my biological mother knew my pimp. And my biological mother came down, and I wasn't even in her care at the time. And she, they just proved that, like, she was my mother. So she took me, waited for them to release my, my pimp, and gave me back to her. So it's very interesting how that all works. And again, I mean, my, my own biological mother doesn't see an issue with it because she was raised, get it how you live. So that's, I mean, like I said, this, the things that we say sometimes, even the, the sayings that we say, get it how you live, you know, it is what it is. No, it is not cool being what it is. So we have to change that. You, you're, you had a second question? I'll get to you. One more. Did that answer it, though? No, no, you answered it perfectly. Thank you. Um, and the second one was, how do you see Oakland fitting into this um, acceptance of uh, this pimping culture? I've noticed this a little, I've lived out of state too, and it's different because in a place like Arkansas where I lived, it wasn't seen like it is here in Oakland. And I feel like it may just be Oakland that it's this huge. So what's your opinions on that? Well, it's crazy because when I was in the game, which is what we call it, uh, when I was in the game, I had met a pimp and I, he was from Vegas and he had brought, I kid you not, he brought six girls out here in a two-seater. I don't know how the hell they pulled that off, but they did. And I'll never forget, he said, I came here because that's what I was told. I was told this is the best place to sell young girls. Like, I was told that. 
And I think that what, what's, what I find out is that there's not really many places that are so accepting. And I think it's just, A, because of the existing stereotypes on Oakland, period. Um, even if you look at that movie Wedding Crashers with, uh, what's his name, Wilson? Somebody, y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Owen Wilson or whatever. They got a part they were, where they were like, oh, well, you know, when they make their fake, fake things, they're like, oh, well, I'd rather be pimps from Oakland. Like, it's something that's, like, become parody now. It's something that's become accepted. Um, I, I, I think, I don't know what it is. I, I think it's primarily because the Bay Area, just like many other places that are known for um, human trafficking of children, uh, it's, it's big cities. So the Bay Area in itself is a big city. And so a lot of people fly through Oakland to get to San Francisco to get to, you know, um, Silicon Valley, things like that. So I think that that's also what's, what's a factor. I think that, that we're right under everything. Um, we are right under the big city lights. We're right in the middle of the mixing pot. And so it's um, also, again, it's an environmental thing. I also think it's a way, and this is something that it's not just, I think this is where it's not just at Oakland, but I'm seeing it nationwide. And for example, it's, it's just society in a, peer, in a whole is that we're in this place that we're accepting that it's okay. We're normalizing that it's okay to get money. One of my favorite rappers, and y'all can call me commercial all you want to, but Drake, he has a song called 305 to My City. I love that song. But he's glorifying a stripper. Nobody talks about, you know, what it means like to, to be a young woman of value and of worth. And so I think that we also have to change just, again, language, the differences to what it means to be like being a bad bitch versus a queen, you know what I mean, and the terminologies that we use. Um, and, and I just feel like here in Oakland, we just have so much diversity. There's so much access. There's so much going on that it just happens to be a subset of it. You know what I mean? And I think that that's something that happens occasionally um, in various different big cities that, are, that have. Does, does that actually answer your question? All right. All right. I, I saw we, uh, we are running out of time. Sorry. So we're going to take I the two last much. questions that I saw with hands. So, and then uh, I'll be here. And so. then, yeah, she'll still be here. That's all. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I really did appreciate it. And I just wanted to um, just make a couple of um, comments that would help pull this together. What we're talking about here is the world's oldest profession. Yes. Um, are people familiar with uh, Silvia Federici, The Caliban and the Witch, where she talks about the process of primitive accumulation and that actually human trafficking is in the Bible. Um, the black market seed money of exploiting women is the foundation for the global economy and always has been. So um, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd love to everybody, especially for you, to, if you're not familiar with this book, to get it because I think it's, you're so powerful. And I, and I feel like this is what you need to just really understand that what happened to you is happening to you, and you do know that, happening to women all over the world has been for centuries, and you're much more powerful than even you know. Definitely, and I really appreciate you making those comments. I definitely want to say again and reiterate that, again, my story is just a snippet of many other people's stories, and if you're into books, another good book that would allow you to understand human trafficking, and I hate to say it because I hate to encourage somebody to buy it because I don't believe in profiting, again, an exploiter. But there's actually a former pimp that wrote a book called Pimpology. And there's an excerpt um, out of one of his chapters where he talks about creating insecurities in young people if they weren't already there, or in women, if they weren't already existing. And so, you know, I think that it's something worth your read, like you said, to bring things together um, in understanding that Although there are existing vulnerabilities, as I asked the questions earlier, um, there are ways in which these exploiters come in and create them as well, and create these, these insecurities. So I just want to follow. There was another question. Um, I have a kind of question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm a mother of three girls, and they're like all different personalities. I do my best to raise them because I feel like I don't want them ever to have to look somewhere else for love or, you know, I support all of their dreams. So like, what advice would you give a parent or a, or a person 
like if you had to give advice to your mom, like what could have been done differently? I really appreciate you asking this question because it actually ties in like the last thing I wanted to say. So I really appreciate you asking this question. First of all, um, do as much as you can, love them as much as you can unconditionally. Second of all, I don't know, you know, and that's to you, but if they don't have a, a father figure in their life, you know what I mean? I would try to find someone in their life that could be a male model, that could take them to the park occasionally, that can do fun stuff with them. That is something that's gonna be very important for a young women's development in the regards to the way in which they see the world. And I know that's something that's so like cliche, but it is so important. Another thing that is so important and it's so pivotal in regards to when we talk about the, the changing in the, of the lives, right, is that, um, we all use this terrible, terrible, terrible terminology, like we're gonna rescue and save these young people. And I think one of the most important things to understand is that no, they saved themselves. And so one of the first times I actually realized that I was a human being was when the woman that I spoke about earlier, she went and took me to get my ID when I was 16. It was the first time I actually normalized that I was a human being just like you. So uh, the things after that that helped, you know, change me or what could have prevented me is for some people, I mean, for people to really help me develop myself as an individual. Like you said, something that was important was that you said that they're all different personalities. Feed into their different personalities. If one likes sports, support their sports habit. If one likes makeup or whatever, you know. But I think that it's, it's getting them involved in things that strengthen them as individuals that are um, self-expressive, uh, that allow them to be challenged safely to allows them to take risks safely. So even if that's like going on a snow trip with an organization or something like that, you know, I really believe in girls and boys programs, girls inks, um, just basically community-based organizations that allow for opportunities of growth. I think it's all about self-actualization and self-realization. And that is what A, prevents, and well, first prevents, but B, what helps um, change as well. And I think so, as much as you can do as a mother, also incorporating a male figure in their life and getting them in, a, in as much um, programs that will con support their individuality and their goals. Because I think that's so much of what's lost. And so I think, that oftentimes young people who are victimized who have come from something, they're faster to get back out of it because they've got something to hold on to. So it's about that. It's about giving them more than just you. They need to have tons of go-to people that are in your circle. I mean, I've, took, I've taken them out of girls and because of that, like, I just, the support system, it's like they're willing to give up and just be like, no, you're suspended from the program because you move too much. You don't know how to sit down. Not understanding that, well, maybe she needs to take a walk. And I think this is really important when we talk about that trauma-informed um, perspective in regards to alternative uh, practices and protocols. So even in the way in which we address young people, you know what I mean? Like, that is, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I think that what's important about having these public forums is that we never know who's in the audience. And hoping that maybe somebody from Girls Inc. hears this and is like, you know, then that needs to be changed. Because what we need to do is we need to build more second chance programs. We need to have more programs that have a due process. And, and that don't just be like, oh, we don't want to deal with your kids, you know, whatever. We need to have more programs that have that because the truth is, is that that's what these kids need. Again, prevention is key. If we keep closing our doors on these, on these young people, the exploiters are going to be the ones that always have their, they're never going to turn down money. They're never gonna turn it down. And, and they know they're gonna get it by, by just drawing them in. And you know, it's just sad because specifically with young girls, we get attracted to the fleshy and we get attracted to the, like the fine boys and we get it, you know, but if we have things to focus on, like I have a play to do, or you know, I, I'm, I'm in dance you know, class, or I'm in, if they give them, make sure that they always are constantly doing something that is their goals, that is something that is of their interest, and, you know, it may not be like Girls Inc. or, or Boys and Girls Club, but like I said, I, I like those programs because they give them other things to do and they expose them. I think the biggest thing is exposure. As much exposure for your child, safe exposure is what's key. Safe exposure. And um, whether that be them have an opportunity to spend the day in San Francisco or whatever, 
safe exposure is the key. It's about, it's about being able to say, I'm more than this, and I'm not going to let. And that you, as a mother, you've done everything that you can, that they know enough. I'm loved enough. I don't need your fake love. So, thank you. I'll be here if you have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day.